different face today <laughs> that is um, behind us, but um, I've come to just let you know that uh, my position here within the church is called presiding clerk. Um, that word can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it's an honor and a privilege that you all have uh, chosen me. To be in this position, Daryl, I hate you. <laughs> oh, really? I love him. He's always uh, he's always on me about getting up here and boohooing. So, um, anyway, it was not a fun thing. Anyway, presiding clerk, what does that mean? What do we do? What do I do? What am I supposed to do? I preside over a lot of things. So, preside over congregational meetings. Preside over elder meetings side over uh, some decisions and forward thinking here within the church. Uh, a lot of uh, what goes on here gets run by me. I get to have an input, and the, the Lord has uh, touched my heart in that, in that way to do that kind of thing. So as again, I say, it's, it's an honor and privilege to serve you in that matter. And the other way I get to serve today, um, and it's a privilege to do that, is read the Word of God. So uh, Aaron has me reading the entire book of Luke this morning. So brace up when you stand up you're gonna be here a while not really no really he does have me reading luke one though please rise uh verses five through 45 so i will be up here for just a little bit and i'll i'll try to uh put some oomph into it but uh, this is the word of god for the people of god in the days of herod king of judea there was a priest named zachariah a division of Abijah, and he had a wife and the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving his priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great up before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife has advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And he realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will 
be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has already conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went into, with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greetings of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believes that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. God's blessing be upon us. Sing it. Thanks, Fred. The whole time I was looking for my Bible, I left my iPad up here after first service. I was like, oh, gosh, brutal. Hey, by the way, this morning, if you're still praying for me and my family for snow, please stop, okay? <laughs> we get it. Ohio's got snow, all right? We get it. <laughs> no, <laughs> super thankful, though, super thankful. Everyone has asked, hey, how's, how's the boys doing with the snow and all this? They're still chomping at the bit to get their sled out, and we don't have enough snow for sledding yet. So I guess if you're going to pray, pray in that direction. But hey, if you were with us last week, we got to intro the book of Luke together, right? We got to watch a really cool video on the first little bit, and we worked through verses 1 through 4, which was Luke's introduction to his book. And we now hop into our first sub-series, which we're calling New Beginnings, New beginnings, and it's quite fitting that we're looking at the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus and a few other new beginning type things, and if you covered this during Christmas, good for you. God bless. Super thankful. Now we get to do it together. Um, <laughs> I'm excited because there is a key word that we use all the time when we read our Bibles, and yet somehow I feel like just our, our world's kind of hijacked it a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? And it's the word blessing, right? Hashtag blessed. And here's the thing. It's like all the time I'm seeing the idea of blessing being so different than what the Bible talks about, right? It's like I think blessing in our minds is more this idea of like Oprah, like you get a car and you get a car and everyone gets a car. And it's like I don't know that that's what the Bible was talking about when it said blessing, and I think there's a portion of blessing that's involved in it. And let me, let me tell you why. The word, that Greek word translated blessed is makarios, which means fortunate or, or happy, enlarged, lengthy. Makarios is used to define the kind of happiness that comes, and catch this, from receiving favor from God. Okay? Consequently, the word can also be translated, you guessed it, favored. So Jesus used the term blessed in this way, though. He used it in the framework of the Beatitudes. You remember in Matthew 5, he has that whole, his inaugural address, if you will, the Sermon on the Mount, and he starts talking about blessed is, blah, 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 and he goes through the list. He's describing, really, the inner quality of a faithful servant of God. So this blessedness is a spiritual state of well-being and prosperity. It's a, it's a deep joy-filled contentment that can't be shaken by poverty or grief, famine, persecution, war, or any other trial or tragedy in your life. In human terms, the situations depicted in the Beatitudes are far from blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Doesn't sound like a blessed person, right? He goes through all of them. But you have to catch this. Because God is present with us through difficult times, we're actually blessed by him in them. 
Keep that thought. Because we're going to talk about blessing today in a few ways. And I need you to keep the same mindset of what I'm talking about, or you're going to think I'm saying something I'm not. All right? You're going to have to keep that framework of blessing. Because we pick up in verse 5, and in verses 5 through 7, we're working through the birth of John the Baptist being foretold. And notice how he opens. He says, in the days of Herod. We have a definite time stamp here. There's a priest and his wife, Elizabeth. See, these events that are going to occur happen to definite people. Notice their condition. Righteous before God and walking blamelessly. That's their condition. Yet, they have no children. Let me explain to you what that would look like in ancient Israel for a woman of her age to not have kids. You would be shamed. As if like something's wrong in your life. You're either sinning or at the very least you don't have favor from God. It's a hard place to be. Especially because we know her condition. She's righteous before God. She's walking with God. So it may come to you to say like, okay, so what's missing then? Right? It's like when the disciples stumbled upon that guy and he's, he's like, he's got something wrong and the only thing that they can say is, who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? Because we look at his physical condition and assume his spiritual condition. So how is it possible? How are they walking with God? How is all of this happening to them? Like, it sounds like he's righteous, his jo- he's in full-time vocational ministry, his, his wife seems to pretty, be a pretty godly woman, and yet, as they're following God's rules, their lives don't have rich blessings. It's like one of my favorite theologians, he once sang this song, he said, it's not always rainbows and butterflies. You know the song? Great theologian, Maroon 5, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> he had a way with words to explain his human condition. <laughs> And here's the thought. What happens when it's not rainbows and butterflies? When it's not always cheesecake and rainbows in life? I think it tells us this, friends. It tells us that those who walk with God, we don't get a free pass from the trials of life. We just don't. But rather, we gain Him. We gain Him. He is our reward. And watch how the rest of this story is going to unfold as they walk with God and they're righteous. Zechariah does his job as a priest in verses 8 through 12, and he's really probably looking forward to this. Let me tell you why. At this point in the priesthood, there was only a handful of people that got to do this service to God. There was a certain sect of the tribe of Levi that got to do this. But at this point, there's probably 20,000 of them. And so it says that it was decided by Lot. Lot's not a guy. It's just they had these sticks and kind of like put their name in a hat and randomly drew him. It's Zechariah's term to go in there. This may be a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him to walk into the Holy of Holies. And if you ever had a a once-in-a-lifetime holy moment where you know you're ministering to God in some way, you probably have this thought, hey, I need to uh, rework my prayer list real quick. I need to work through what I'm asking of God, what I'm expecting of God, because I'm expecting that I'm going to meet with God in a really, really phenomenal way. He may be expecting to hear vision for his life. He may be expecting to see how God's going to bless him, and yet we have a moment where Zechariah meets an angel, and not just any angel, but Gabriel. And here's the thing. I don't know where you're at with your angelology nowadays, you know, but let me help you walk through it a little bit. There's a handful of different types of angels. You have your seraphim, your cherubim, and then you have this hierarchy amongst angels, really three main dudes we talk about. We have Gabriel, who's like the messenger of God. Michael, who's like the brawler. He's getting in all the fights. And then you have Lucifer, who at one point was like the head worship leader of heaven, and then you know the rest of the story, right? And so, we only have a handful of angels that we know about like that. Here's the most iconic things that come out of angels' mouth. Two, two different phrases. When they're in front of God, you hear, holy, holy, holy. 
And then when they come before people, it's like, hey, please don't be afraid. Because <laughs> they were some really intense kind of beings, right? The, the handful of descriptions we have of angels in the Bible is really scary. Six wings, cover eyes, cover feet, other two keep them floating, okay? <laughs> and then you have other ones where it's like, he's like a wheel with a ton of eyes on it. It's like, what are you saying, right? But then you have this curious verse that says, be careful how you treat people because you could be entertaining angels, right? So he meets Gabriel, which I think Gabriel's a pretty bad dude because when, he, when anyone meets Gabriel, he has to say, hey, don't be afraid, <laughs> all right? So we're in this concept of it. What, look at what he tells him. When he says, don't be afraid, he then shares, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and he'll call his name John. At this point, Zechariah and Elizabeth are quite old, okay? And if you're thinking right now, you're in Genesis, and you're thinking Abraham and Sarah, you remember that whole story? Then you're Bibling the way you need to be Bibling this morning. That's exactly where Luke wants you to be thinking, Abraham and Sarah-esque, if you will. You need to be thinking about that. His response... This is where he gets tripped up. His response is in disbelief. But I'll be honest with you, and I don't need a show of hands, but I'll show you my hand. There's a few things on my prayer list that have taken the back burner because I'm saying, God, I've prayed this so many times and you're not answering. And you didn't answer in time and now I'm just not praying anymore. And again, hey, I, I'm not saying that's the most, fa most faithful approach. I'm just saying it happens, happens to all of us, I believe, at some point. Leads us to our first point, our main point here, is that we are a people from blessing. Let me explain what I mean. We fight from blessing. We don't fight for blessing anymore. Here's what I'm trying to say, is that when you're fighting for blessing, when you're trying to gain the approval and blessing from people, from parents, from coworkers, from your job, from your roles and responsibilities, maybe even from your own self-worth, you'll notice that it's always going to be an upward battle, an uphill battle, and it's never going to work out. You know why? Because we don't fight for blessing anymore. We fight from blessing. You have been fully accepted, fully loved, and fully forgiven in Christ Jesus. Amen? And from that blessing, I now fight the trials of life. I fight from blessing, saying, God, I know that you're for me and you're not against me. It's actually what leads King David, before he's crowned and he's running for his life from Saul, he says these words. I'll put it up on the screen for you. In Psalm 34, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in him. It's that the trials of his life, he's literally running for his life, okay? And yet he has the words to say, Blessed is the man who finds his refuge in God. Taste and see that he's good. How can he say that? It's because he's understanding blessing here. That he's not fighting for a blessing from God. He's already fully equipped in blessing, and he's fighting from that blessing. See, I think this is a life-changing concept for us. Because when we're no longer looking for that approval, and we're no longer looking for that blessing from all these other things, we get to now walk in the good works and the blessings of God. Let me say it in a different way for you. When I've accepted who I am in Christ Jesus and receive all that he has done for me through his finished work on the cross, I'm no longer fighting for the blessing and the approval of others because I am showing that my life functions from the blessing of God. And now, now I step into trials of life fighting from these blessings and not trying to prove that I'm worthy. Jesus already said I am. I'm not trying to prove that I'm, I'm, I'm something because I believe in a God that's already something. And he said, you're, you're worthy. You're so worthy that I'd love you to death. I died on a cross for you. You're so worthy. And I no longer have to strive and gain that from other people when I've gained it from Jesus. That's what leads the Paul, Paul the Apostle to write these words 
He says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a man who knew trials. This is a man who'd been imprisoned for his faith, who'd been beaten, literally beaten to death at some point, and then like God does his thing, you know, how God does that thing. <laughs> Ray like literally gives him life in his trials. It's because he understood that he stands in the blessing of God, and from that blessing he's able to do all that God's called him to do. See, in verses 19 through 23, we pick back up in the story, and, you know, this is a scene where we kind of get to see how ridiculous it is to, uh, to question God, but let me, let, me, let me describe it this way, because I've, I've questioned God before, okay? I don't need a show of hands, but I'm certain a few of you have questioned God in certain areas, okay? But in my situation, it doesn't seem as ridiculous, <laughs> Right? Okay, you, you, you feel me right now? Like, it's not ridiculous when it's my life. But when I'm seeing Zechariah, who literally has an angel, the Gabriel, standing in front of him, sent by God, telling him what's going to happen, and he goes, yeah, I don't know. It seems ridiculous, right? It seems a little bit ridiculous. But this is why I think it's ridiculous in someone else's life and not mine. And also... Key note here is God doesn't respond to his people like this anymore. Okay, this is an old covenant thing we're seeing. Old Testament thing you're seeing happening in the New Testament, right? Because Jesus hasn't made the new covenant. He hasn't died and risen from the dead yet. And so we're seeing God still deal with his people in this way. You need to know this. Because now you stand in the righteousness of Christ. God doesn't respond to me and he doesn't respond to you in this way anymore. He responds to me as a son because of his son. Because he gave his only son, I now stand in sonship, in the grace and mercy of God. Amen? That's where we stand. So don't be worried. Like, you're not going to question God, and God's just going to, like, strike you, and you're mute. <laughs> okay? But it does bring up a point, and you're going to hear me say this and beat it like a dead horse time and time and time again. Because... There's many times that God's going to want to speak to you in your life. And hey, it may happen, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I don't think Gabriel's going to come and tell you how it happens. But this is what I do believe. If you want to hear God's voice, read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak audibly to you, read your Bible out loud. Okay? Like that's, God chose his words very effectively. And he put it in your Bible. Use it, read it, <laughs> consume it, like the word says. It says literally, eat it up, get it in you, okay? But it is quite comical to see someone else's disbelief, okay? It's a little comical. And I, I pick up in the space between verses 23 and 24. And I, I read my Bible pretty often, okay? Nothing crazy, but I read it pretty often. And now I'm trying to, like, I'm reading it in a way where I'm like, okay, I need to read it how it's written because this is how it's not written, okay? There's a space between verse 23 and 24, and my mind always gets stuck here. Verse 23 ends with him being mute, and then he goes home. Verse 24 picks up, and his wife has now conceived, and she's five months pregnant, okay? I took it as a personal application to say, Aaron, if you just shut your mouth and listen to your wife, you'll conceive in 2024, okay? Like, that was my kind of little bit of personal application. I don't think that's true, but I do think this is fairly true. How cool is it that for two trimesters, Zechariah had to just shut up and rub her feet? Can I get an amen from the ladies in the crowd? You know what I mean? Imagine him, like, coming home from work, and this is where my brain's at, comes home from work, and now he's got a tablet, and he's chiseling out, like, tonight I will not be rubbing your feet. I'm watching Reacher. Please leave me alone. You know, like, <laughs> he's, like, trying to explain to her that, like, tonight's his night. Uh, it's just not going to work, okay? It's just not. Anyways, I'm kidding. It's not in your Bible, and where the Bible's silent, I'm going to try and remain silent. I just got to fill you in on where my head goes when I read the spaces in between some verses. See, here's, here's the beautiful thing, though, in verse 25. 
which, by the way, is our response to God and blessing, is when Elizabeth says, look at what the Lord has done for me. Look at what the Lord has done for me. See, her life and her testimony glorifies God. And this is our proper worship. When God has done something for you, we point it back and say, man, God, look at what you've done for me. I think it's a beautiful point of her story that when God deals with her shame, when God deals with the way that other people have viewed her for God knows how long she's been carrying that weight, she's able to look up and finally say, God, you've dealt favorable with me and look at what you've done for me. It's a powerful, powerful testimony of her life. See, in verses 26 and 27, again, we're now moving to the birth of Jesus, which is kind of a mirrored story. That's why he writes both simultaneously. Luke gives us a definite place. We're in Nazareth. A definite time, six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy. And two definite people and their conditions again. We've got Joseph and Mary. And they're betrothed, and she's a virgin. See, there's three stages to a Jewish wedding, and you have to understand them to kind of get a concept here. You had the engagement, which is like a formal agreement made by the fathers. And then you have the betrothal, which is the ceremony where there's mutual promises, and they were made and exchanged. And then finally, marriage, which is approximately like a year later when the bridegroom comes for his bride at an unspoken time. And when a couple is betrothed, they're under the obligations of faithfulness. And a divorce was actually required after betrothal. So this isn't just a casual promise they've made to each other. And Mary is, Mary is clearly said to be a virgin. There's no ambiguity here. It's nothing, there's no trickery of words. She just hasn't had sex. No sexual relations. Virgin. Cool? That's what they're trying to get at. Her name, Mary, is the Greek for the Hebrew name Miriam. And Miriam is that same name of Moses' sister in Exodus. And Miriam means exalted one. And it's a fitting description of the soon-to-be mother of the Messiah. So notice what happens in verse 28 and 29. The angel says to her, Gabriel says three things to Mary. You're highly favored. The Lord is with you. And you're blessed. And now, I truly believe... All of these things are true of Mary. God said this to a specific woman, a little teenage girl, probably around 13 to 16, who's now pregnant, which in our culture we're like, okay, that's weird, you know, but is what it is. She's a a real person in real time. But it leads us to our point two, which is in blessing. All of these things that Gabriel says to Mary, the exalted one, All of these things are true of the believer in Jesus Christ. We are highly favored as Mary was. The Lord is with us, and we are blessed. See, there's a Roman Catholic prayer that begins, Hail Mary, full of grace, right? It's true that she's full of grace. I'm not saying Hail Mary. I'm just saying she's full of grace, and that's true. But notice that it's a received grace. God has given her that grace. The same way he has given you grace in the form of a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Mary is full of grace. And that's key. We have to remember that we've been given grace. I try to take every opportunity to nuance some words for you like I did with blessing. I'm going to do the same with grace for you. Grace is receiving something that you don't deserve, okay? Whereas mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. Let me, again, give you a few more shades there. By grace, I've been saved, and I'm going to heaven. I'm receiving something that I don't deserve. Because of the mercy of God, because the wages of sin is death, I am not condemned to hell because of the righteousness of Christ. Mercy and grace seem to coexist in this beautiful light that says I'm receiving something in grace and I'm not receiving something from mercy. You with me? We good? It's what leads Paul to then write 
Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, which gives us a more beautiful picture of that blessing. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is the gift of God. And the reason why is so that no man may boast. I love this idea that no one can boast in the grace of God. It's not a result of your works. But this is why. For we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand, that you should walk in them. See, when we stand in the grace of God, it changes us. It changes both instantaneous, in the moment I put my faith in God, and then it's ongoing. Our position changes immediately as we go from slave to son, enemy to friend, lost to found. That's the grace of God in your life. Faith in Christ instantly results in a new heart. The old is gone, the new has come. But transformation is ongoing. Transformation is ongoing. The good works you're saved to do happen over time. It's a daily choice to put off the old and put on the new. One of the most beautiful stories for me in the Bible of this is Lazarus, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and his sisters are there and he commands him to get up and, 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 and rise from the dead. Justification. He's saved, right? Like, that's, that's the picture of salvation. Just, we, we accept the spoken word of Jesus, you're saved. But then notice how we have this kind of like sanctification moment in his life where he, he tells his sisters, hey, take off the dead cloth that's wrapped around him, right? And it's like, it's like God is going to use the church, your community, everything around you to start stripping that dead cloth, stip it, stripping that sin from you. And as those things fall off, you start realizing there's good works for me to walk in. Amen? There's good things for me to walk in. It says that when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. The fact that Mary's troubled at his saying shows a bit of humility here. Mary was surprised to hear such extravagant words spoken over her. You imagine an angel standing there and saying, hey, you're highly favored by God. He's with you, and you're blessed. She's like, uh, no, I had a Pop-Tart for breakfast. Like, what? Like, no, like, like you gotta hear who I am right now as a teenage girl, you know? But hey, it leads me to think this. If Mary thought this about God's words being spoken over her, I can't help but to think that some of us feel the same way. That we won't walk in the words that Jesus has spoken over your life. He calls you, he calls you highly favored. He says that he will walk with you all the days of your life. And he calls you blessed. Are you willing to accept that this morning in Christ Jesus? Are you willing to accept that this is what God says about you? Walk in it. In verses 30 through 33, he says, you found favor with God and you're going to conceive in the womb and bring forth a son. Notice here, and I have to say this now because we're shifting gears, the focus is not on Mary. The focus of this story isn't on Mary, but on her son. The focal point of the entirety of Scripture, Jesus. And he is unmistakably identified as the Messiah who's predicted in the Old Testament. Notice what the angel says. He will be great. No one's influenced history more than Jesus. Right? Let me tell you what one of the greats says about him. I, I pulled up his quote because I just can't say it any better. Is it not proven that he is great? Conquerors are great, and he's the greatest of them. Deliverers are great, and he's the greatest of them. Liberators are great, and he's the greatest of them. Saviors are great, and he is the greatest of them. Amen? Jesus is great in the perfection of his nature. Jesus is great in the grandeur of his offices. Jesus is great in the splendor of his achievements. Jesus is great in the number of those who rescue, he, he rescues. Finally, Jesus should be great in the estimation of his people. Jesus is great. That's my Jesus. It says he'll be called the son of the highest. Jesus would be the son of Mary, but not only her son, he would also be 
and known as the Son of God. He'd have the throne of his father David, which the Messiah was prophesied to have, coming from David in 2 Samuel 7. He is the rightful authority to rule over Israel, and his kingdom has no end. Mary knew exactly what Gabriel was getting at here, because I think she knows Isaiah chapter 7, where it says, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. But this is what I think about in verses 34 through 37, about Mary's question. I think it was logical. She asked the same question that Zechariah asked, but his question was asked in skeptical unbelief, and her question is asked in wonder-filled faith. And I think that's the difference here. It's not that God doesn't want to deal with the skeptics. It's that there's a different approach, a heart's posture, when you walk in blessing, when you stand in it, and you fight from blessing, you realize there's a different heart posture that says, God, okay, Isaiah 7, you've been talking about this for a hot minute. A virgin's going to give birth. How does it happen? Right? I think it's a wonder-filled faith instead of, God, you can't do this. Like, stop. There's the difference of the, difference of the heart posture. Almost as if he's going to be responding of that Responding to that question, he's saying the the power of the highest will overshadow you. This is what you have to be thinking about here. That overshadow word is the idea of like a cloud coming upon something and overshadowing it. The times we know about that in Scripture is when, when Moses goes up the mountain and gets the Ten Commandments. There's that overshadowing that happens. The Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus has that whole cool thing and Moses and Elijah show up, That's that power of God overshadowing. What's happening uniquely for this teenage Jewish girl is that God would come over her in power, overshadow her. There is no doubt in my mind, and there is no doubt in the scriptures that we're speaking of God himself in this baby. The same power of God that was with Moses and in the Old Testament is doing a unique work in the life of Mary. This child would be equal to God. Jesus did not become the Son of God. He was called the Son of God, recognizing his nature from all eternity. That's what's happening here. He who was and is and is to come. That's my Jesus. See, we have this unique moment at the end in verses 39 through 45, and I'm going to wrap up here for you guys. <coughs> Mary visits Elizabeth. I thought that was a bit curious, that her first thought is, like, I'm going to get up and go to my cousin's house, you know? Like, but if you can think about it, she's betrothed at this point, meaning there's a year before she's actually married and they are having sex, meaning she's going to have this baby and look real pregnant before she's married and bring great shame on her husband, on her family, on everyone else. And at this point, she feels that the only one who can even understand what's happening is the woman who was mentioned by the angel, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, her cousin Elizabeth. And so she makes an 80 to 100 mile journey from her house to her cousin's house because she's so serious about wanting to just Hey, what's going to happen to me? I think it's a beautiful picture for us to know that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can rely on one another. That God is doing a work in everyone in this room, and if you want to be a part of that, you can just strike up a conversation. You don't even have to drive 80 to 100 miles. If you drive 80 to 100 miles to church, God bless you. (laughs) I highly doubt you do, but if you do, come talk to me afterwards. That's crazy. Um, What's beautiful is that the first person to recognize this is unborn John the Baptist, leaping for joy in his mom's womb. He hasn't even been born yet, yet he has this spiritual awareness and could respond to the Spirit of God working in Mary's life and his Savior, Jesus. She says, blessed are you, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. You have to realize here that Elizabeth believed and also believed that the baby in Mary's womb was the Lord. 
and that this was a promise of God. Because she later says, blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things. See, Elizabeth is recognizing that Mary's faith played an active role in receiving the promise of God. God's promises should never make us passive, church. They should prompt us to seize them by faith. Elizabeth wanted to encourage Mary's faith, so she declares that there will be a fulfillment of these things that God promised you. It leads us to our third and final point. As Christians, as believers, we speak forth blessing. It's what God's called us to do. We speak forth blessing. It's because Elizabeth's response to Mary is the way we should respond to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm so good at compartmentalizing my life. I don't know about you, but it's like, this is my work life, this is my home life, this is my social media life, I can't post the dark memes, here's my spam account. You know what I mean? You got all these compartments in your life. You know what I'm talking about. It was quick, but it was there. <laughs> all those things. And yet Jesus says, I want to be Lord over your life. He's not viewing me compartmentalized. And I can do my, my best job at wanting to say, this isn't really who I am, or it might be, but I'm hiding this portion, or this portion is really who I am, or I get to walk in this opportunity, all these things. But God sees me and wants to deal with me as a whole person. I can even get into the assumption sometimes that God doesn't care about what I say, and I don't need to care about what I say. Because of the things I've posted, or the things I've shared, or these things. God does care. He cares deeply about what you say, and you should care deeply about what you say. Let me tell you why. Because if we could just have this thought from our story, what would it look like to have the faith of Mary and accept God at his word and then watch how he changes us to speak life and blessing the way Elizabeth does? I, I'm always hung up on this verse when I talk about uh, our words. It's found in Proverbs 18, verse 21. I can put it on the screen for you. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. What an awesome power to have, right? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. But as one other great theologian once said, with great power comes great responsibility, Spider-Man. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. Still got you with me? Praise God. I want to invite the worship team back up to close us in a song. As we conclude here, I want, to, I want to think about this. I want you to walk in the application that God has for us here. We fight from blessing. We stand in blessing, and we speak forth blessing. My prayer for us as we understand Luke together is that you would understand your position before the Father, which would lead us to a place where, where we fight from blessing knowing that every good and perfect gift is from above. We stand in blessing, knowing God is with you. He calls you highly favored and blessed. And finally, we speak forth blessing as those who do good works so that they would glorify their Father in heaven. Thank you. Be still. There is a healer, and his love is deeper than the sea, and his mercy is unfailing, and his arms a fortress for the weak. And let faith arise, let faith arise. There is a river that flows. 
continue to speak forth blessing over you each service and just walk in what God has for us and so in number six when the priest of Israel was commanded by God he said whenever my people gather bless them in this way so may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday.